Hey, welcome back to Epic. As always, I hope you're doing fine. Today, we're going to talk about the greenhouse effect, what it is and how it works. So what you have to understand here is that it actually has very dramatic consequences for life on the planet. Without the greenhouse effect on the Earth, the average global temperature would be about minus 15 degrees Celsius. And if you live somewhere, say in Canada, where in winter it sometimes does get to that temperature or even lower, you might say it's not a problem because we're Canadians, hey? But actually that temperature is not very comfortable for humans, not for animals, and definitely not for vegetation. So the greenhouse effect is good for the planet, but all good things come in reasonable amounts. Too much is not good. And too much is what we're doing to our atmosphere at the moment. So in the 1820s, there was a French mathematician and physicist who was born in Auxerre called Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier. He's the guy who's credited for thinking about the greenhouse effect and greenhouse gases to some extent and how they affect the temperature on the earth. Now, in the course, we already talked about greenhouse gases, which ones they are. But just as a quick reminder, um, we have carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, nitrous oxide, N2O. And the last one is uh, very hard to pronounce, but I'll do my best. Uh, tetrafluoromethane. Just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? CF4. The last one, uh, CF4, by the way, it's about 5,000 times more potent than carbon over a period of 20 years. And methane is in the news a lot recently because methane generally, uh, apart from agriculture, is in areas of the world which are permafrost. Now, permafrost, like the name implies, are areas which are permanently frozen. But because of global warming, these areas are now thawing and they release huge amounts of trapped methane into the atmosphere. And methane is very dangerous because over a period of 20 years, it's about 84 times more potent than CO2. So methane has the capacity to cause catastrophic climate change over a short period of time. And scientists these days argue, in fact, that methane was a key player behind the largest mass extinction recorded in the history of life on Earth in the Permian era. That lasted from about 299 to 251 million years ago. And if you're interested in that topic, you can read a paper about it. It was published in Paleo World. It's in volume 25, issue 4, December 2016, pages 496 to 507. You're welcome. It's entitled uh, Methane Hydrate, a Killer, Cause of Earth's Greatest Mass Extinction. So there are some physics that you have to understand here. Basically, molecules vibrate. They vibrate by simply moving closer together than further apart. Uh, the nitrogen and oxygen molecules, for example, are vi vibrating in this very simple mode. Now, molecules with three or more atoms can vibrate in more complex patterns, and molecules with more complex patterns are more likely to interact with passing waves of electromagnetic radiation. This is why carbon dioxide, for example, absorbs and emits infrared radiation, while nitrogen and oxygen molecules do not. The ability to absorb infrared radiation is what makes carbon dioxide a greenhouse gas. Like I mentioned before, water vapor and methane molecules also vi have vibration modes that cause them to interact with passing infrared waves. And as you might expect, methane and water vapor are also greenhouse gases. While methane is very potent and can cause catastrophic climate change in a short amount of time, we certainly can't forget about carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide lasts in the atmosphere between 300 to 1,000 years. So the Industrial Revolution lasted from about 1760 to 1840. During that time, we pumped a lot of emissions into the atmosphere, and these particles last hundreds of years, hundreds of years, in fact. So now with the most recent emissions, we're basically adding to that huge carbon budget. Now, a couple of solutions. When it comes to CO2, we could consume less. This is definitely within our means. We could travel less as well. 
when it comes to methane, a lot of methane comes from agricultural sector. And this is, for example, animals like cows, and you could eat less beef. I don't eat beef at all, for the way. Uh, by the way, I stopped many years ago, and I don't feel any worse. So yes, you could transition to pork, and especially chicken. Uh, chicken is the best option at the moment. Well, the best option is to be vegan, actually, but I understand not everybody wants to be a vegetarian. And as a general trend, it seems people buy more and more stuff. In fact, um, the American comedian George Carlin joked about that by saying, uh, we, keep, we just keep buying more and more stuff and then we run out of space in our home, so then we get a bigger home, uh, so we can get even more stuff that we don't need. For example, in the US during the Black Friday sales, uh, the people rush into the stores, uh, Hey, that's where the zombie movie genre came from, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure that was the inspiration. Uh, people grab things, um, let me get another Blu-ray player that I don't need. And these are things that we as humans, we can control. It just takes a little bit of effort. Now, in the US, uh, carbon dioxide, so CO2 emissions, account for about 82% of all greenhouse gas emissions since the Industrial Revolution. So what is the exact breakdown of that consumption? Well, mainly it comes from electricity and transportation. These alone account for 70% of the emissions in the US. And this is an interesting statistic, which I thought would be relevant here to the discussion, because only about 15% of the CO2 produced is being offset by forests. And to make matters worse, as I mentioned before, people are actively engaged in deforestation. And this is causing millions of hectares of carbon trapping trees to be destroyed every year, releasing billions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere and contributing as much as 25% to the causes of global warming. Methane, on the other hand, primarily comes from industry, uh, natural gas and petroleum systems, and from agriculture because of respiratory and digestive emissions from livestock, as well as manure management. Between 1990 and 2012, uh, methane emissions in the US decreased by about 11% because of decreased exploration of natural gas and petroleum within the country. Uh, but emissions from agriculture, though, have increased. Now, in a country like the US, most jobs these days are in the service industry, but in many other countries, most people still work in farming, uh, although that is changing as well because people are moving away from rural area and into urban areas. The type of jobs are changing as well. So most people do not wanna be farmers anymore. They wanna be engineers and doctors, for example, teachers. So that means they don't work the land but still, in some countries, the share of methane emissions is larger than in others. Okay, so now we know more about the greenhouse gases, but how does it all fit into the greenhouse effect model? And basically, like I said before, without the greenhouse effect, the Earth would be permanently frozen. So some amount is good for life on Earth. But the problem is, by burning, burning fossil fuels adds additional greenhouse gases to the atmosphere that would not normally be there. And these additional gases trap more of the sun's heat, warming our land, air, and water. Global warming is harmful because it upsets the natural balance of the earth, shifting weather patterns, causing extreme weather events and rising sea levels. It will cause enormous economic damage and our way of life uh, for centuries to come is likely going to change as well. The effects are already being seen today, in fact. So the greenhouse gases basically act as a layer which traps the energy of the sun and bounces it back to the earth. Most of the energy comes from solar radiation that is absorbed by the earth and then it bounces back into space, either directly radiated or through thermal radiation. Scientists like to use many analogies when they talk about greenhouse effect. Uh, a common one to think about is a blanket. So in winter, if you're cold, you put on a blanket and that way you can stay warm. But what you have to imagine here is that if you keep adding more and more blankets, it eventually gets way too hot. 
more than you asked for. And you may start to sweat and eventually it may lead to dehydration and you will feel, feel pretty bad after a while. The other analogy I hear sometimes is the kitchen sink. So imagine that you're cooking something and you're cutting some vegetables, in this case carrots, and carrots block the hole in the sink. So now very little water is trickling through. Some water still goes through, but basically your sink is getting full and that's not good. And this is in a way the greenhouse gases. They block the energy that is supposed to leave the earth, mainly in the troposphere. And that energy is bounced back and reabsorbed in our air and in our oceans and in land as well. And that is why we are seeing global average temperatures that are increasing. Finally, uh, one experiment you can easily do at home is you can have two thermometers and please make them the same, same brand, etc. Put them in direct sunlight so you can observe the temperature. Uh, just put one of them in direct sunlight and the other one put it nearby but inside the jar. Then observe the temperature. Read it every five or ten minutes to build a record. Now you will notice that the thermometer not in a container which is exposed to air that is constantly changing temperature. Warm air mixes with passing cooler air. But the air inside the jar isn't exposed to this running air. It just gets warmer as the sunlight heats it up. A greenhouse, in fact, works in a similar way, as heat coming from the sun is trapped and it cannot escape back through the glass. Although the greenhouse effect that is taking place in the Earth's atmosphere is a bit more complicated, the basic idea is the same. The layer of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere act like the glass in the greenhouse and stops heat from escaping. Next time, we will talk about human psychology and how people think about climate change.